But the National Athletic Trainers Association has been a huge supporter of NSSA. I uh, can't tell you where we would be without them. Ellen Satloff is here representing NATA and has been for how many years now? We always, 12 years, 12 years. Uh, and we can't thank them enough for their support. So please give it up for the National Athletic Trainers Association. I would be remiss if I didn't mention Bob Kazmus, the head athletic trainer at Catawba College, who usually acts as our liaison to NATA. He was out of town this week and sends his regrets and his salutations. But now uh, we will get going with our program. We have two fascinating seminars today, as well as an awards presentation. And I would like to uh, bring up Marisa Brunette in one sec after I read her, her very well-edited bio. Marisa was most recently Vice President of Sports Medicine for Cora Rehabil Rehabilitation and Sports Medicine Clinics in Florida, where she managed the athletic trainers and their outpatient rehab clinics and outreach athletic training programs throughout the state. Marisa is here this weekend as the chair of the NATA Public Relations Committee. She has served as Vice President for the Southeast Athletic Trainers Association, as well as President and Vice President of the Athletic Trainers Association of Florida. Marisa was also a member of the Florida Board of Athletic Training, which oversees all of the licensed athletic trainers in Florida. That's my cell phone. For more than 26 years, Marisa has served her communities in various roles, such as public speaker, medical coordinator, host site athletic trainer for numerous state, district, national, and international sporting events. They include the annual East-West High School Shrine football game in Orlando. Marisa has received NATA's Most Distinguished Athletic Trainer Distinction, NATA Service Award, and has been inducted into the Athletic Trainers Association of Florida and Southeast Athletic Trainers Association's Halls of Fame. Please welcome back to Salisbury, Marisa Brunette. Marisa. Thank you, Dave. It's great to be back here, and I always appreciate music. This is a highlight um, for me as chair of the NATA PR committee, is to be at this meeting. Uh, a lot of great people here. We have a fantastic relationship um, with NSSA. And this is our 13th year uh, for the NATA Excellence in Sports Medicine Reporting Award. And I'm going to start with that. Um, this year's winner is John Hoover. And John has been with the Tulsa World um, uh, since 1992, so he's been there 21 years as a sports columnist. And um, among other things, John's covered the Dallas Cowboys, the Kansas City Chiefs, the Arkansas Razorbacks, Oral Roberts, uh, Golden Eagles, Oklahoma State Cowboys, and Oklahoma Sooners. John has been reporting since 1985, and he's been covering the Sooners since 2011. In, um, he was named the National Beat Writer of the Year by the Associated Press Sports Editors, and he's won numerous writing and reporting awards at the World and other newspapers. John was also the sports uh, editor in, help me, John, Taliqua? Tahlequah, and I practiced. Um, and assistant sports editor in Ada. John was actually born in the North Pole, Alaska, which I thought was very interesting, and he played football wrote for the school paper there, and received a journalism degree from East Central University in 1989, where he met his lovely wife, Holly. Um, he lives in Broken Arrow with his wife and two kids. John, as I said, is our 13th award winner this year. And what I want to stress, and uh, Ellen and I have made quite a bit of money this weekend stressing proper terminology and just reinforcing uh, the use of athletic trainer versus trainer. And that is definitely something that we look at when we review our contest entries. And it's, it, again, it's very important to distinguish between our profession, athletic training and athletic trainers versus personal trainers. Um, there, there was uh, it, the issue not too long ago where the trainers and the steroid issue um, kind of crossed over into our profession, which wasn't really who was in charge of that or what we did. Uh, a, a huge win for the NATA this year is that we are now in the AP style book. 
uh, which has recently been released, and the definition of athletic trainer is in there. So again, uh, we encourage you to use the proper terminology when reporting and helping to educate the public. Um, uh, there is a distinct difference there. John's stories, um, he had a, a, a great group of stories here that included a story on catastroph catastrophic injuries in football and the insurance benefits that the NCAA offers when this occurs. There was also a story on the revelation that Oklahoma high schools, as with most across the country, are severely understaffed with medical personnel and athletic trainers on site. And, and one that is coming more to light, especially with all the youth sports injuries that we're starting to see, is that he also had a story on the inadequate resources available to over 10,000 youth football players in his area as well. And again, uh, it's our pleasure to um, congratulate John on being our 13th award winner of the NATA Sports Medicine Reporting Award. So I'd like to invite John up. There's a check. Thank you. This is the big one. I promise I won't take very long, uh, just a few minutes to, to say thank you to some important people and uh, get across kind of my, uh, one of the points that I had in, uh, in writing that package. Uh, it's at TulsaWorld.com if you guys are interested to see it. It's, uh, it turned out to be about three and a half pages of uh, broadsheet text. Um, I want to thank Dave Gorin, uh, obviously the NSSA, the, uh, Ellen Satloff from the NATA, uh, the judges who picked the work was thank you. and. Obviously, my editors at the Tulsa World to give me three and a half, two and a half pages. Uh, <laughs> you let you, you can write until the story is told, and that's what I was able to do there. Also, like to thank my wife, obviously Holly. Um, Twenty-two years we've been married, and uh, my kids back home for their really their endless enthusiasm and support for what I do. And you guys are sports writers; you know exactly what I'm talking about with uh, with the sacrifices that you make, the on-call hours that we all work. Um, as as Marisa said, um, the, it's, it's tough to, you look at the staffing of, of nationwide high schools, um, certified athletic trainers, it's around 50%, I'm told. And in my opinion, that's way too low. But in Oklahoma, that number is actually around 27%. Most of those are not full-time. So that's pathetic. That's horrible. Uh, for high school football players, 27% uh, of the high schools slamming into each other every Friday night, they don't have athletic trainers there. Um, so I'd like to get that changed. I'd like to, and it, it, listen, in youth football, uh, and I know this because my son played last year for the first time tackle football, and it was, it was, it was an experience. Youth football in Tulsa, and there's, like she said, 10,000 kids that are being covered, 10,000 kids that are not being covered. It's around 0%. We, have, we had games last year where kids were just dropping like flies. One, one game, and I, this is not an exaggeration, I did a concussion test. I wrapped an ankle, applied ice to a broken arm, uh, did another concussion test, and then checked the kids' bruised sternum all in one game. All five kids ended up leaving the game. They only had 15 kids on the roster. So we finished the game with 10 kids, basically. One of them had to go in, go in and play hurt. You know, I'm wrapping, uh, wrapping ankles and applying ice. I'm a sports writer. I'm a dad. I'm not supposed to be doing stuff like that. So we've got to get more certified athletic trainers, more qualified professionals out there. Um, and since this, since this uh, story published last fall, I've kind of been on a mission to do that, to improve the coverage in Oklahoma. And if anybody from any other states has any ideas on how your state high school association or local youth leagues uh, has gotten that accomplished in your areas, I'd love to talk to you afterwards. Uh, just put, put our heads together and, and get our little athletes covered with some uh, certified athletic trainers. Thank you all very much. Thank you, John. We're going to begin um, this year's sports medicine seminar uh, with just a, a couple housekeeping issues. Uh, we are getting ready for our large national athletic trainers symposium, which will be held in Las Vegas uh, starting the week of June 24th. 
And at that time, we will be doing our annual press conference that we want you to be aware of. And it is on Tuesday, June 25th, and you'll be able to access that. This year's um, topic is preventing sudden death in secondary school athletic programs, best practice recommendations. And we do have uh, press releases hot off the press and available for you if you are interested on both of our topics that we will be presenting today in the back of the room. Ellen, what, what area did you put them in? Back in the left-hand corner, my left-hand corner, um, for your convenience. Again, as I said, this is our 11th year of, prov of um, promoting and sponsoring the brunch and presenting this seminar. And we've gotten some great feedback this weekend. It's always great to hear from you guys that this is something that you look forward to and it's been able to help educate you and, and uh, utilize that in your everyday lives as, as well as in your professional lives. Uh, we are thrilled this year with the speakers that we have um, available to speak to you this year. I'm going to introduce our first speaker who will be talking on concussion update, which we all know is um, definitely still a very hot topic out there. It's Jace Jason Mahalik, and Jason is a Keenan Jr. faculty fellow in the Department of Exercise and Sports Science at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and he's the co-director of the Matthew Geller Sports-Related Traumatic Brain Injury Research Center. He's a, a neurotrauma researcher with an emphasis on biomechanics related to military and sports head trauma. Jason has developed smartphone applications with the goal of preventing unnecessary secondary complications related to sports concussion and has an interest in applying emerging technologies as an injury prevention strategy. Dr. Mahalik studies the common pathways to managing head trauma from the sideline through the emergency department. His secondary research interests include the neurocognitive and postural deficits associated with sports-related mild traumatic brain injury, analyzing postural contr uh, control strategies and investigating the sequelae associated with mild traumatic brain injuries in athletics and military personnel. Jason lives in Durham, North Carolina with his wife, Jonna, and daughter, Jenna. It is my pleasure to present uh, uh, Dr. Jason Mahalik to present the concussion update seminar. I'm not much of a podium speaker, so I'll just kind of stand here on the floor. Sorry, I didn't, thought the lavalier was on when I started talking. Um, so I've been asked by the National Athletic Trainers Association to uh, come here and attend today and to uh, kind of give a brief 15, 20 minute at most uh, overview of concussion, kind of the, 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 the current state of affairs as it were. Um, I have a PowerPoint up there. Some of the pictures are going to be um, helpful. Uh, there's some, some animated clips there. There's not a lot of text on it. I'm kind of trying to approach this more from a feng shui side of things and to kind of get more pictures here and less, less text. But, this first animation depicts essentially what concussion is. And so we have a situation where, um, you know, if we define it in very broad terms, uh, it's a scenario where there's a mechanism of injury. So that's one of the, the key things of a concussion. There has to be something that causes a transmission of forces to the brain. And normally what happens is the athlete is traveling down the field and they sustain a collision and the head comes to a sudden stop, kind of like a car crashing into a brick wall, right? The car comes to a sudden stop and the passengers inside the vehicle continue to move forward. That's why passengers go through windshields, okay? And so the vehicle stops, but the passengers continue to travel, and that's what's happening with the brain. So the head stops, the cranium, the skull, the bone part stops, and the helmet around it stops, but the brain inside it continues to travel, and it hits the inside, and then it kind of jostles around within the cranium, and that's what causes concussion. So a concussion isn't a skull fracture and it's not a bleeding of the brain. It's a very functional injury that CT scans and MRIs are not capable of identifying in a hospital setting. So that, that's one of the key things that we as professionals in our own right have to recognize that not every concussion is going to result in some catastrophic outcome and it's not going to result in CT or MRI deficits, right? We all have kids. John just mentioned earlier his, you know, his son plays football. So, you know, if his son sustains a concussion and goes to the ER, a lot of parents get a lot of comfort out of knowing that their child doesn't have a skull fracture or a brain bleed. And I would agree, that's a good thing. But at the same time, it doesn't mean that a concussion has not taken place. Okay. <clears throat> 
the nomenclature, a rose by any other name would smell just as sweet, and we can't hold that adage to concussion. A concussion is a brain injury. It's not a bell ringer, it's not getting dinged, it's not getting your bell rung, it's not being shaken up. It's a concussion, and a concussion is a brain injury. And we, certainly in your field, have a huge role in helping kind of change the, the culture and the nomenclature around how concussions are referred to in the literature. Here's some data here, slides skewed a little bit to the left there, but essentially we asked the number of athletes to kind of reflect back on the previous year and let us know how many times they suffered a concussion. So out of, out of one study, we see that about 10% of the athletes, this is the one that's on the far left here, 10% of the athletes reported having a concussion. And then we asked them, how many times did you get hit in the head and experience symptoms? And we listed some symptoms that are consistent with concussion. And we used words like bell ringer and getting dinged. And that same group of athletes now are reporting upwards of 30%. So it lends to the under-reporting and the misreporting of this injury, and that is what can cause some serious long-term problems for these young kids, particularly those that are playing at levels where the support isn't available to them from a medical standpoint. Another study uh, held several years later, about five years later, we see that there's an increasing number of people reporting concussion. It's not because there are more concussions that are actually occurring, it's just that more people know what to look for, and so they're more adept and more readily uh, accepting of the fact that they're experiencing symptoms of a concussion. It's becoming more and more commonplace for people to actually acknowledge the fact that they're injured. There are a number of things that are circulating out there, ways to prevent concussion, and this first picture here shows a kid with a mouth guard. Uh, mouth guard companies have been very notorious, not all of them, but some of them, of promoting their product as a means of preventing concussion. And the reality is that mouth guards are not designed to do that. There's a number of studies that have looked at custom mouth guards, which are the really expensive ones that you could breathe and talk properly while wearing, and they're certainly good for that purpose. And comparing them to the $3 boil and bite mouth guards, there's no difference in how either of those types of mouth guards can prevent concussion. And in fact, when you study athletes that wear mouth guards and those who don't in sports where they're supposed to, we don't see a difference in the injury rates either. But they are really good at something. And there's a stack of data about yay high that totally supports them for protecting your teeth, right? So wear mouth guards if your kid has $3,000 braces in or if you don't want to chip a tooth, they're fantastic for that purpose. But don't go into a clinic and tell a doctor, there's no way my son has a concussion because he was wearing this mouth guard because that, that just doesn't hold true. Helmets are certainly another area that is out there in the media. Um, helmets do a couple things really, really well. And what they're designed to do is to keep athletes alive and recoverable. Okay, so let that kind of digest along with your brunch. Okay? Helmets are designed to keep people alive and recoverable. People used to die playing football. 30, 40, 50 people a year would die playing football. Now that number is less than four. Okay, because of the hard shell helmet and the current models of the helmets that exist. Can they help to reduce some of the forces that get transmitted to the head? Absolutely. But will they ever be able to prevent concussion? Will a crumple zone in the front of a vehicle ever prevent a passenger from flying through the windshield? The answer right now is no. It'll certainly help, but that will never be prevented unless you and I can figure out a way to change gravity and change physics as we know it today, which probably won't happen in our lifetimes. Okay, so helmets do an excellent job, and we need to acknowledge the job that they do. Kids are alive because of helmets. It doesn't mean they won't get concussions. Okay, we need to acknowledge that as well. The other thing is we could design the best helmet, but people have to wear it properly, right? So here you've got a gentleman going, oh no, he lost his head, and she's going, I can't look. And here's the helmet facing to the left, and there's the nose and the eyes of the person facing to the right. So not only is the helmet two feet above this person's head, it's actually flipped and turned in the opposite direction. Will a helmet help this individual? Absolutely not, okay? So helmets are supposed to be there to protect the brain, they're supposed to be there to protect the head, and they can only work if they're being worn properly. Now we're talking about sports, it's sportscasters and sports writers associations, so that makes sense, but the majority of these brain injuries, the majority of concussion actually occur outside of sport. It occurs in kids riding their bikes down the street. Uh, the leading cause of traumatic brain injury in teenagers is driving a car, right? So if you tell your kid, you know, you can't play football, it's too dangerous, then take the car keys from them, right? Because the same logic should apply there as well, right? And so, Helmets play a role not only in sports, but you're riding your bike. I walk around campus and nothing drives me more batty than seeing a student bike around campus with a bicycle helmet dangling from their handlebars. It just drives me batty. And I, I saw one of my students that did that and I, and, and I called her out. 
not in front of everyone, of course, but I say, you know, you really should wear that helmet. She's like, how did you see me? I see all, is what I tell them, right? <laughs> Another area that is starting to gain a little bit of interest, uh, it took me a while to dig out my high school hockey picture there, um, <laughs> is, is that of cervical muscle strength. And so here's a theory behind neck strengthening muscles because I've seen some, some, some articles where folks are talking about that. If you have two collisions that are identical, same player going up against the same opponent, same location of head impact, same velocities, the physics of the impact are identical. Okay? But in one scenario, the person doesn't necessarily see it coming, or they don't tighten up their neck muscles. Well, you've got a large amount of force, you have a small mass of the head, which is usually about 8 or 9% of the person's total body weight, and you're going to have this large acceleration, this large movement, right? We all saw the video at the start of the presentation. You're going to see this large acceleration movement of the head. And so you're likely, or you're more likely, I should say, to have a concussion. Now, the exact same collision, the person strengthens or at least uh, certainly contracts their cervical musculature. And now the mass that you're trying to move isn't just that of the head. It's now a rigid segment. It's the head, neck, and torso. And so there's a much greater mass. If it's the same amount of force, you're going to get a much smaller acceleration. And so that's the theory behind it. And I say theory because in practice, it doesn't always hold true. Okay? You have to, you could be the Hulk, right? But anyone who saw the Avengers saw that he was stunned a couple times when he got hit. Okay, so you could be really, really strong, but if you don't fire those muscles at the right time in the right circumstance, then it won't be able to help you as much. Okay, so it's not the only answer. So I'm certainly in, in encouraging good physical strength. I think it's going to help prevent a lot of musculoskeletal injuries, but it's not the answer to preventing concussion. We could change rules. Right, changing rules, although there are many purists uh, that are out there and some even here in this room that feel some of the rules shouldn't be changed. I agree to a certain extent, but I think some rules do need to change and there's, and there's a benefit to changing those rules. We've made head-to-head -head contact illegal and that's going to eliminate one of the largest mechanisms of concussion in pro and amateur sports. We have changed the position of the kickoff. And a lot of people have argued, oh, well now there's a lot more touchbacks, the game is less exciting. Well, the number of points being scored as a result of runs that are attempted or returns that are attempted is the same as it was before the rule change. The only difference now is that runners or returners are being more selective about their opportunities and they're only taking those where they feel they can explode through the tackles and make a great big play. So it's just as exciting. There are just as many score or points being scored on kickoff returns, but the difference now is there are more touchbacks and as a result, there's been a 42% decrease in the number of concussions on kickoff return plays in the league. Okay, a very simple rule change, um, but it can result in a game that's equally as exciting and certainly helps to protect athletes that are most vulnerable, right? You get a whole bunch of 250 pound people and you say run 60 yards down the line and hit the first thing that moves, someone's bound to get hurt. I think we could all appreciate that. However, before we go rushing to change any rules, we need to have evidence, right? We need to do research. We didn't just change the kickoff rule. We had done some research. My group at UNC Chapel Hill was a part of that uh, effort where we identified that special teams plays were more likely to result in these more frequent and more severe head impacts than, than regular offensive and defensive plays. That was some of the data that fueled some of the decision making. USA Hockey changed the rule a couple years ago where peewee players, 11 and 12 year olds, weren't allowed to body check anymore. And that was the result of data that had been published out of Canada that showed two provinces, Quebec and Alberta. Quebec, you're not allowed to play contact at 11 and 12, and Alberta, you are. And they looked at concussion rates and found that the kids who were allowed body checking at 11 and 12 years old were getting concussions at a much higher rate. So there was data to inform that change. Um, and so I don't think we should rush to change rules just because we, we can or we should. I think we need to let the data and the evidence support those rule changes and do them in a very measured process. Easy for us to say, we're the Monday morning quarterbacks, you know, we're just kind of sitting back watching the game. Of course, we know all the rules. We never miss a call and the referees on the field really aren't good. I mean, we've all been there. Some of us even write about it. Um, and so that's something that we need to also consider is how do we take mom or dad who does this, who sees the hit on NFL Sunday or sees the big hits in college game day Saturday and then has to go the next day and teach their Pop Warner child how to body, or how to body check, how to tackle properly and how to do it safely, right? How do we change what we see to what we do to make it a safe sport for kids to play? I'm not opposed to football. I like football a lot. I'm partial to hockey because I'm Canadian, but I 
my kid, God willing, will we'll play a contact sport. I'm not opposed to it. My, my, my mission in life is not to ban sport. My mission in life is to make sure kids are as safe as possible when they play it, right? People are going to get hurt. That, that's part of participating in sport. But the long-term issues of not being in sport, I think, far outweigh the risk of injury while they are playing sport. So how do we give this individual here the tools in real life to identify injuries and to make safe decisions for kids? And there's a number of technologies that exist out there. Um, one of the things that myself and a, a colleague of mine at, at Children's National Medical Center in Washington, D.C., we developed smartphone applications that give that information right there in the smartphone of an untrained medical person, so a parent, a coach, an athlete, teammate, whoever, uh, to help guide you through, did a mechanism exist? Are there signs and symptoms consistent with concussion? And then it makes a recommendation to, to say there's something here that may be concussion and you should hold that athlete out and send them to a physician. I get a lot of kickback from coaches that say it's not my job. It's not my job to identify concussion. It's not my job. My job is to coach. I agree. I do not disagree. It's not your job to diagnose concussion. But it is your job if you're going to take that responsibility of, of watching over a team of young individuals to at least be able to identify what signs and symptoms of a concussion look like so you can make sure that kids aren't going to you know, get hurt far worse than they already are. And one of the analogies I use, heart attacks, right? You're sitting down at dinner, you're with a colleague, you're with a friend, they start to get clammy, they start to get sweaty, their arm is you know, painful, uh, they're complaining of chest pain, all these things that you know are consistent with the heart attack, but you're not going to diagnose a myocardial infarction, but you know the signs and symptoms. You're going to call 911 and get your friend help. The same thing is true with concussion. You're not going to diagnose the concussion, but you should know that big hit to the head, Kid was slow to get up, stumbled to the sideline, complaining of headache. Hmm, there's enough suspicion that this kid is injured. We should have someone more trained look at that child. And I think that's what we're trying to get at. So my soapbox is that we've been talking about it from a medical standpoint, but the reality is the medical team extends to everyone that is in this room and everyone hopefully who is watching this, this lecture abroad. The people in the media, can play just as important a role in spreading the information about injury and how to care for injury than the people that are actually tasked with, with, with providing that hands-on care. So that's my soapbox. We're all part of the medical team. Here's a little pic of my daughter in a playground without a helmet or bubble wrap. So I am holding true to my word that I'm going to let my kid grow up and, and play and have fun. Um, and my goal, again, is not to abolish sport. It's not to ban sport, but it's to make it so that when it's time for Jenna to strap on a helmet and go play hockey or play volleyball or, or crew or golf or whatever, that those sports are safe and that the people that are actually coaching her know enough about the rules and the techniques to coach and teach her in a very proper and effective manner. So with that said, I do look forward to uh, reading your works and listening to your works. Um, and uh, I thank you for your time and your attention this morning. Thank you. Um, we will leave time at the end in case you have any questions for either one of our um, speakers on any of their topics. So again, um, thank you, Jason. I hope you're, you can hear me. Can you hear me? <laughs> um, my NATA mother, as I so lovingly call Ellen, reminded me that uh, I neglected to inform you that with our um, award, trying to give you a little more incentive for next year, um, John also had his travel paid for by the NATA as well as, I, I think you might have seen me hand him a piece of paper before he got that beautiful glass plaque. Um, but the award does include travel and a $500 um, check as part of the um, NATA award. So we'd like to see more entries next year. That being said, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Um, Mike Ryan has been an athletic trainer in the NFL for 26 years. He was an assistant athletic trainer with the New York Giants, and he's currently in his 19th year as the head athletic trainer for the Jacksonville Jaguars, my home state. Uh, he is the co-author of the NATA Lightning Safety uh, Position Statement, again, which we do have copies available for you in the back of the room. Mike is currently serving as the president of the Research and Education Foundation for the Professional Football Athletic Trainer Society. 
He is on the Medical and Science Advisory Board for the Corey Stringer Institute, as well as the Sports Concussion Medical Advisory Board. Mike has served as an expert on the NATA Interassociation Task Force on Exertional Heat Illness, and he is the founder of Mike Ryan Fitness, which is a sports medicine injury prevention and self-rehabilitation website. Mike has accumulated many acc accolades, including the Southeast Athletic Trainers Association and the Athletic Trainers Association of Florida Professional Athletic Trainer of the Year, and, uh, as well as a member of the NFL's Athletic Training Staff of the Year. Mike is an avid runner, as you can see. He's an extreme sports enthusiast and triathlete, and he has completed, I believe I counted, six Ironman triathlons. So I'd like to uh, welcome Mike up here to talk to you about lightning safety. Thank you, Marissa. Appreciate it. Thank you, Marissa. Appreciate it. And you notice I went behind the speaker. Appreciate the, uh, Jason gave me the heads up on that. And, and I appreciate you know, this opportunity speaking to you and being recognized through the NATA. And also I have to acknowledge uh, Dr. Mahalik's uh, work and what he's done. I mean, he's literally one of the leading experts in the world on concussions and the work that he's done and his uh, fellow uh, participants in concussion management through the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And from an athletic training perspective in the uh, NFL, the concussion issue is an important issue that we work on every day. We have a big meeting in Las Vegas next week, and a lot of the work that comes out of North Carolina has really helped their efforts. So I want to thank him for that and uh, give his due credit. Uh, it, it's a pleasure to speak on this and the issues involved with lightning. When I was a little kid, I was always kind of mesmerized with lightning. It was kind of cool and, and the whole thought process of it. I remember in a 4-H camp, I'm not sure if they have 4-H camps down here, but in Massachusetts it was big. We got hit in a lightning storm one time and stuck in a little cabin and it was, it was eye-opening, it but it's still kind of intriguing. Well, that intriguing concept ended on, July, on August 1st, 1977. One of my classmates, Robert, got hit by lightning and killed. And the, the poor guy to begin with had uh, spina bifida, walked with forearm crutches, and he lived on a farm. Well, his job with his brothers is he was always driving the tractors because he really couldn't w walk very well. The happiest, nicest kid you could meet, very pleasant, had an upbeat personality, and they had to rush to get the hay into the barn because the rain was coming. They got it in successfully. Well, he walked over and opened the garage doors to see if the rain started, and bam, it killed him on the spot. And that sort of really opened my eyes to the fact of what's there, and that, that intrigue factor went to a serious manner of what was there when it really hits home in a small town of, of, uh, of a few hundred people and one of them gets hit by lightning. So it really opened my eyes to that. And if you look at the, the research on it and what's there, when I first moved to Jacksonville, I was with the New York Giants for six years and we didn't have a lot of lightning to deal with there. We had, we had the traffic and the New Jersey Turnpike, that was dangerous enough. <laughs> but when I moved to Jacksonville, the two things I was really interested in, when I got down there in 94, the historians in the room would realize we didn't have our first year team was until 95. When 94 I was down there, we were building a new stadium, working out of trailers and getting things set up. And the two things I was really focused on to begin with, besides getting the athletic training room up and running and putting together staff and everything in it, was heat and hydration and lightning. And research, I got a hold of a lot of old athletic trainers and specialists and research people on a lot of those issues. And I never forget, and I still have the notes from it, I called the gentleman with the military that I tracked down, was the military lightning specialist. And I couldn't get this guy off the phone. And, and he talked in, in some amazing stats and how things work and in the statistics, because he said, you guys have it easy. He said, lightning rolls around in your games and you can call timeout, everybody runs into the nice and safe. We got a war going on, we have military exercises, we got to bunker down, we got to realize how we're going to deal with this. And, and it was fascinating, he was telling stories about when people do get hit by lightning, I, I originally thought that the electricity would travel through the nervous system and he says, no. If someone gets hit by lightning, if you look at them quick, you can actually see the fluid boiling underneath the skin. Think of that. The statistics with what's there and how those things happen show the dangers that are there. And when you really look at the facts, 25 million, 25 million lightning bolts hit the ground annually around the world. And if you look at the death statistics around the world, 24,000 people a year die by lightning, and almost a quarter of a million are injured through lightning around the world. So this issue, a few may hit close to home like it did me, but the bottom line is it's a dangerous component that's not going to go away and we have to worry about it and, and manage it accordingly. And, and when you look at the statistics and how it happens, the big focus, and, and I was very um, excited to be involved with this position state with the NATA on this, to focus on sports and recreation. Because when you look at the, the statistics, 
a lot of people that are involved with this and, and have, are injured and get killed in this are involved with a lot of the sports, but also the recreation. Because a lot of teams can get a hold of a meteorologist like we do and work with, with Doppler and work with a lot of high tech stuff. Well, the softball league down the field, down the road, doesn't have that opportunity. So this paper is really positioned in a way that educates everyone around sports, outside activities, the family barbecue, and really kind of takes what's an issue here and applies it to people that can apply it on a regular basis. And I think you as sports writers and sportscasters, the education of that, kind of like we talked about with concussion, is an important part too to, to address that and ask questions and ask the kind of things of opposing what's there and what's being done at these particular venues. Because if you look at, and this truth be known, that press box in most of those stadiums, that's just a big square lightning bolt. And you, and you guys are sitting up in it, so <laughs> write that down. <laughs> So make sure it's being done right and they have an emergency action plan that can take care of it because obviously everyone's in, in danger and we don't want any of the media to get hurt, right? If you look at the statistics too with what's there and, and, and we say, what are we going to do about it? Are we saying people out here to kind of prevent lightning from happening? No, it's the management of it and how do we apply that? First and foremost, the things we need to do to, to stay safe is to have an emergency action plan. And that emergency action plan involves obviously the medical staff, but also involves everyone around it. When you're talking about schools, you're talking about principals, you're talking about leagues, who's in charge and who's making those decisions. But having that emergency action plan has to be in place, has to be put in writing, and everybody involved with it has to have an impact on that before the lightning rolls in, before the storm comes around, before the two a day start. And that's an important part. And it can be as simple as documenting how does the ambulance get in there on game day? What's the nearest hospital? Where's the nearest safe place? Because an important thing we looked at this is to acknowledge what is the safe locations and what are the unsafe locations. A lot of people get hurt by lightning because they get under a shelter. When you look at the statistics, a majority of the people that get hurt by lightning and killed by lightning are the ones standing next to trees. The lightning's coming, the rain's coming, let's get under cover. One of that tree is more dangerous than anywhere else. So if you look at acknowledging simply fact, when the lightning rolls in or the potential of lightning, where is a safe place? Where is an unsafe place? And the bigger the venue, the more difficult that becomes. So looking at that and kind of getting that in writing with what's there and need to know who that is and how that works. And we look at that emergency action plan, having it in writing is important as well, like the AED. Does anybody here know where the AED is in, the, in this hotel? We all assume it's at the front desk, but bottom line, if someone in this room drops and you need to get an AED, there's that magic three minute window. And other than being in a hospital, the next safe, safest place to have a heart attack is actually in a casino. Because everybody's under the eye, the camera's watching, everybody's trained, people are stressed, uh, everybody's there gonna know what's going on. So when someone goes down, they can get that AED on someone in that magic three minute window. But knowing where that AED is an issue, and there's some well-documented cases, one in particular when um, injury, issues of, of players have gotten hurt and have gone down, and you can see the AED sitting in the background that no one used. That can't happen. So a simple fact of an, a an emergency action plan of knowing where the AED is and how to use it is real important. The other thing is knowing where the safe place or where it isn't. We talk about issues about the, um, the shelters. That's a big problem, especially in some of the places where they have uh, picnics. You know, in, in big parks, they have the big metal roof with the metal rods standing on concrete. That's not the place to be. The other place not to be is standing next to any friends, tall friends with plates in their forehead. Stay away from that. <laughs> Send them to the other side of the field. That's important. Also an important part is to know the chain of command and having that predetermined. In other words, who's in charge of saying when we're going to get off the field and when we're going to go back on, but having that person and having that person with the authority to make a decision. I, I learned this very, very well early on is I was out on the field one time when we had the lightning and myself and the director of security were assigned to be the lightning guys. Uh, you, you don't, nobody wants that duty. Well, when the lightning would roll in, you know, they'd look at us and we're trying to work things through the meteorologists and things made it difficult. i never forget one day, true story, lightning rolls in, it's black all around us. So I say, coach, we gotta leave the field. Everybody leaves the field. The coach isn't sure. I think I see some blue skies over there. So everybody runs inside and I'm standing out in the field with the head coach and I direct to security, and we talk about all this stuff. Well, that day in the newspaper, there was an article, again, I'm an extreme sport enthusiast and love bungee jumping and skydiving and great white shark cage diving and stuff. And there was an article in the paper about me running with the bulls in Pamplona. 
in that same morning. So we're standing out there, and the coach is like, I think I see some blue skies and the lightning bolts all around us. And right out of the blue, he looks at me and goes, what the hell's wrong with you? They're running with the bulls. I looked at him, so what the hell's wrong with us? We're standing in a lightning storm looking for blue skies that's 20 miles away. <laughs> 20 seconds later, a bolt of lightning hit, and he was the first one off the field. <laughs> and then practice was canceled the whole day, so it was perfect timing. But that priority is what you're looking for, what you need to get done. The true story, an NFL coach I know that their athletic trainers have given me this amazing story that this one coach in particular would ignore lightning. And he was in an area where lightning was always going to be hit. And in their field, they had a fence around it with a bunch of palm trees. And lightning would come all around. And one time they're out there and the lightning's hitting and everybody, the players are cowering down and that coach wouldn't even give acknowledgments to the sky. And a lightning bolt hit one of the palm trees just outside the, the, the fence and the palm tree was burning and the head coach never even looked at it. And they finished the practice and kept going and you know, nobody in that field, they say it was higher than 5'5 five because five, everybody's squatting down and running around the field trying to get it done. But that can't happen. That, that's an old error. That should never happen again. But the bottom line is setting up who's that person to make that decision and they have full authoriz authorization to make that decision, again, when to leave the field. But the important part is when to return to the field. There's a thing they, in the business they, they refer to as a bob, a bolt out of the blue. Lightning can hit 10 miles in front of a storm. One of my assistants was telling me a story. He was at a softball game when he was in college. And storm was approaching pretty far away. They could hear the thunder. Didn't really pay much attention to it. And right out of the blue, a bolt hit the pitcher. And she just curled up in a ball and, and, and was dead in a very short period of time. Well ahead of the rain, well ahead of the storm. So the bottom line is that this position statement is looking what's there and realizing the fact if you can hear thunder, it's time to move off that field. The old saying is if the thunder's roaring, if the, if the thunder roars, it's time to go indoors. Again, the thunder roars, it's time to go indoors. Because if you can hear that thunder, that storm is within 10 miles of, of where your location is and looking at what's there and having those decisions to make that. And what's the decision to go back on the field? And sometimes that's a real danger because the rain stops, you get a little bit of cloud and people move out there. The tail of the storm is a hard one, especially a fast moving storm. It thinks like it's out of the way, but again, 10 miles in front, 10 miles in back. The bottom line is once the thunder has stopped, if you can specifically say you know that storm has gone 10 miles away or a 30 minute window, after that storm the thunder has stopped, that's the time to go back outside. And we all know, a lot of those coaches, whatever the sport, don't like that window. They, they, they want to give it a lot less time to get back out there. But bottom line is, what are we trying to do? We're trying to keep athletes safe and keep athletes healthy. Okay, utilizing the, the proper weather specialist. If you can work with a, a local uh, National Weather Service specialist, whether it be the, the, low, the, the news stations are great. We have a couple of news stations we work with. Also, we work out of the airport. So we contact them. And north, north, the airport is north of Jacksonville. So they're a great one to kind of say what's coming down from the south. But most of our storms are coming in from the west, southwest. So we use a downtown radio station. We're in contact with them. We have the lightning detection system on one of our towers at the stadium. We actually had a preseason game about six or seven years ago. Lightning bolt hit one of the towers prior to the game during warm-ups, during a preseason game. And I was actually just coming out of the tunnel at the time. And you should have seen the look in the faces of people coming out of the, up that tunnel. It was, uh, it, it was impressive how loud it was. And, and how people get off that field. But bottom line is we have a multiple system. We have the airport giving us heads up. We have the local weather station, which is literally, I'd say, 600 yards from our stadium. They can give us the Doppler feedback. And they're in touch with someone on the field, one of our actually our strength and condition coaches. So he has a phone. So it's not like I'm busy rehabbing someone. or someone's doing something, we got the phone in the back pocket. This is someone that, that storm's anywhere near. He's on the phone. And he can contact our, our director of security as well, who's on the field as well. So it's someone who can allot that kind of time and attention and also we'd have someone that's monitored indoor, indoors that has it on the, on the TV that's coming off the detection system on the stadium. So bottom line, there's a lot of things out there. There's some, some great handheld devices now that kind of look at the lightning. Uh, but bottom line is you have to put that stuff in play before you really need it. That's the important part. The communication's key. And that's the part that people in this room that I'm excited about, that you can get the message out there. Because bottom line, if, if you can acknowledge these and you, and you give some recognition to this, and no one likes to be questioned. But if your venues and your facility and your organizations, whether it's your kids' softball games or where you're working, I, I think it's everyone's responsibility, medical, media, family, parents, co-workers, school officials, to say what do we have in place to address these issues before they come out. Because I think if we look at those and we question those, as we know, things that are measured improve. And if we kind of look at that, where, where do we stand now? What changes have we made? We have a lot better chance of getting that done because people don't want these issues to happen. And, and again, it's an easy thing to kind of push off or worry about it. Yeah, we know where to go, where the nearest hospital is. 
If we don't do things right, that, that athlete, that parent, that person there won't need that hospital because if something happens, that hospital's uh, behind the scene and we don't need that. That's how catastrophic this can be. So addressing those early is important. And we look at what we have to do also as far as educating our, our, our young athletes. Uh, the keeping, keeping athletes safe with the issues that we have is, is real important. And I think if we look at the settings, like if we look at the recreational issue with a lot of the leagues, and if you look at the numbers of the athletes that are out there, there's a lot of them. So having these athletes safe at young age and, and uh, older athletes as well is real, real important what we have to do. So I think if we look at those and address those early on and get that recognition, that's helpful. Another important part of this is our parents. And if we get the parents of these students to get involved with what's there, a lot of times if we look at this, the, the, the small percentage of the people that are actually injured by lightning are actually have direct hits. I never forget the uh, gentleman that I spoke to on the, the military, the lightning thing is, he talked about about five seconds before you're hit by lightning, you can usually feel the hair in the back of your neck go up and you can actually taste aluminum in your mouth. That's your body depolarizing as those electrons are starting to kind of reconnect and that's not a good sign. And, and he, he talked about the military people, these guys with these supportive heads, uh, helmets that they have on, you know, that's a real concern. So bottom line is knowing the signs and symptoms, knowing what's there and how to deal with it because if, if an athlete is hit, I kind of run, ran away with this one, but bottom line is a lot of the small percentage of the athletes or individuals are hit directly. It usually comes in directly. So in other words, you're by a tree. Someone was telling me a story earlier about someone was holding onto a railing and it hit the bleachers. So a lot of it is an indirect hit. So they get shocked and they go down. Bottom line is as soon as someone gets hit, literally a fraction of a second later, they are safe to touch. There's no capacity for the body to hold on to that electricity. So if someone does get hurt, you'd address them like you would a normal CPR. And, and having CPR issues of, of what we need to do is important as well in that AED. But bottom line, addressing them with what they need to do, a lot of times is burns involved, but the cardiac issues. Most people die indirectly from the lightning hit and they have a cardiac arrest. So deal with that AED, CPR, and the things we have to. Everybody in this room, I'm sure, travels and, and is on unusual flight patterns dealing with travel and road games. A lot of times you see people on the plane and everybody's tired, everybody's sleep deprived, there's a lot of issues. Those are the settings where we tend to see more problems. So coworkers and athletes, young and old, having everyone around here prepared to that by having your CPR and having basic first aid is real important. A lot of times you see stuff happen and people just stand away, whether it be a car accident, and kind of watch something happen, wait for medical personnel to be there. But a lot of times addressing things early on for everyone and getting those people and activating EMS early on uh, can literally save lives. In closing, if we look at all the things that we're doing with athletes and, and, and protecting each other with, with lightning, it's important to know that the only safety policy is only effective if it's put in play. And I think everyone in this room of, of how we address things, and we look at lightning, we recognize the dangers, and we look at ways that we can prevent it. As simple as saying, if lightning comes here, this is a place to be, this is not a place to go. And also it's important to note the fact that you have to allot for the right amount of time to get to safety. For instance, if you say, okay, the storm's here, it's three miles away, let's go, well, if most people in that venue, it's going to take them five minutes to get to where they need to be. Look, do the math. They're going to be in danger as it is. And also, it's important for them to be in the setting. Like I said, my friend Robert, you know, he was in the barn. He was safe. And what do you do? He opened it up so he wasn't technically in there holding on to uh, two metal doors. That's a real issue. And what's the difference between a safe place and an unsafe place? Well, a safe place is not a shelter. A safe place usually has plumbing and electric, electrical circuits to it. Why is that important? It would give someone, when it gets hit, to disperse that, to, to ground it off into the ground itself. And that tends to go around the individuals. Compared to somewhere, if it's a shelter, it, it tends to kind of encompass the whole space in between. And the other thing important to note, if you're in a metal, well-structured car, and you're not touching the doors, and you're inside the car or van or bus, that's usually a pretty safe place to be. It's a lot safer than being by a, by a tree or your friend with a big plate in his head. But if you're in that kind of setting, that's important. But knowing those and designating them, what's safe, what isn't, well enclosed, indoors, away from metal, plumbing. A lot of people, if you're in a house, you buy electronics, you buy plumbing, you buy something that's going to, again, take that electricity and bring it through the house. That's a real problem. People I know who have been seriously injured and killed sitting in a toilet. Lighting hits, goes through the plumbing, filled with water, they're a conductor. So again, simple educations, you're out of a, a dangerous environment, but within that safe place, it's important to know what's safe and what isn't. So I, I appreciate your time. Uh, we're, Jason and I are going to open things up to question here to address these issues. But again, I, I thank you for the opportunity to speak to you, and, and I thank you ahead of time for 
bringing the safety concerns and issues that you need. Uh, my email address is up here. Any questions you may have or issues we can get the position statements to. I know we have some in the back. Uh, again, our job is to help others stay safe and I, I thank you for your efforts. Thank you. We're going to open it up for any questions. Uh, I think you can help me on that side, and um, we'll deliver the mics on each side of the room. If you have questions for either one of our experts. So if the lightning is near and my head is, is uh, If my hair is ri rising on top of my head, What am I going to do? Am I going to lie down on the floor? Or? Refer, do you have a plate in your head? Uh-uh. No, no, okay. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the safest thing is to squat down and put your butt down to your heels, get in a squatting position. It technically isn't laying flat down. It gives yourself a bigger surface area. Yeah, you're a little bit lower, but bottom line is your shoes are a great conductor, so you're getting lower. The skull, I don't want to get this in an anatomy lesson, but your skull is not a good conductor of electricity. So most people get hit in the side of the neck. So if you're feeling that your hair is actually rising, there's some electrons that are starting to connect those negative charges, and usually it's a positive charge on the ground. 90% of the discharge is from the negative to the ground, positive being the ground, negative being in the clouds. And it kind of connects what they call stages, where it actually comes up and down and it'll transfer there. So bottom line, if you're feeling that sense that, that your hair is starting to rise, uh, it's time to change positions. Good, good question. Mike, I had a question for you. Uh, and both of you guys, thanks for doing this really interesting stuff. But Thank you. Mike, specifically for you, as a, I'm a surfer, so maybe you can relate a little bit. For years and years and years, you know, as I sat in the water just off the beach uh, with high rises, with lightning rods all around me, as lightning approaches, a lot of times, sometimes rain does as well. And so what it does is it makes the waves glassy, which is perfect for surfers, which means I'm staying out in the lightning a lot of times. Whereas my friends and everybody else is going underneath the buildings a lot of times. Am I completely and totally unsafe in the water in that scenario? Yes, and my wife's a surfer too, so I know that, that mindset. And yeah, maybe better surfing, but yeah, because you're, you're sitting in a big conductor. That lightning could hit a mile away from you and you're sitting in a path where that electricity is gonna go through. So large bodies of water, swimming pools, all that is a real danger. So are, are you safer? Absolutely not. Okay. Am I safer under the building then? If it's a well-structured building, not a, a simple shelter, uh -huh. you would be safer in that structured building than you are in the water, without so a doubt. So in the water, a mile, pretty much, the, the electricity can travel up to a mile, you're saying. Is that correct? I, I don't know the distance of what can travel, but it will travel through the water. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, if you see lightning over water, you see multiple hits. Because mm -hmm. the water tends to be at a steady level, so it's not just that one bolt that come off the land. You tend to see a lot more of those stages. So opportunities to get hit in water, and the other thing, if it just stunned you, it's one thing to fall on the ground and be a little dazed on it. It's another thing to fall off a surfboard with 55 feet of water underneath you. So the dangers, whether it be from the hit or indirectly from the hit, um, the, the outcome's not good. So I'd, I'd say follow your buddies to the shore. No, probably not, but <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know the, you know the, the mindset. I do. Um, the other, uh, on land then, if I'm standing on land and lightning strikes 50 feet away, you know, what's the travel velocity or uh, travel distance on land with electricity? There's, there's six different ways that you can be impacted from that lighting. Uh, whether you're in direct contact, obviously the direct hit is a no-brainer, but a lot of it is kind of arcing out indirectly through you, and a lot of it goes through your feet. So it, it'll, it'll disperse itself in a larger area. Obviously, the closer you are to that, that hit, the more danger. The guy I bought my last car from was telling me a story, and the guy was kind of quirky and kind of nervous, and I found myself... He, he was telling me a story, he'd been hit by lightning twice. And I, found, I found myself thinking, I wonder if he was quirky before I got hit or whether it was after two, the, 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 the two wake-up calls. But he got all excited about this one time. He said he was in, in the service and he was holding onto a big metal rod on the tarmac. I don't know, that's not a smart thing to do anyways, but he said the lightning hit him. He got all excited. He said it was like slow motion hit and he said, I saw this big blue arc work out in front of me and his commanding officer was in front. And this was, I think, that got him real excited. He said, my my commanding officer just hit him like, boom. And he said in this big blue wave, my guy just shot through the air like 10 yards and skidded across the tarmac. He got his arms all burnt up. Again, he was, he was an interesting guy. He has some good stories. But bottom line is, things can arc a lot of ways. You, you're talking about the temperature. We're talking about 50,000 degree temperature at the strike of a lightning. 
That's five times hotter than the surface of the sun. That's, that's nothing to mess around with. So when that kind of energy hits somewhere and disperses, whether it's a short arc or a little blast, whether it runs through your shoes, the kind of shoes, the insulation you have is an issue. But a lot of times when that kind of energy goes into, into different types of objects, it doesn't flow through nice and easy like it does you know, through, through your cable uh, TV at home. It comes in and shoots all over. So wherever it can arc to a point of least resistance, and a lot of times it's going to go to flesh. Flesh has fluid in it. Average body is somewhere between 61 and 78% water. You're a pretty good conductor. So whether it's going to run through a concrete slab or run down your leg, um, it's probably going to take your leg. And uh, Mike, I got a quick question. First of all, I live in South Florida, so I understand the, the lightning issue. There you go. One thing that I've always found bizarre, you're watching a game, and they're warming up, and there's lightning, so the, field, the players leave within seconds. You're left with 60,000 fans in the stands. Are stadiums built to accommodate the, the issues of, of lightning so their safety too? Because they're just as important as those players. And I know no your doubt. focus is on the players, but it's like, uh, there's 60,000 people paying the bill, and they're exposed, so what about them? Exactly, it's a great point, and, and are they, most of them built for that? Absolutely not. And I know one of the things that the, this, this position statement is really pointing out is the fact that if there's an issue and if there's an approaching storm is to stop the entry into those arenas, into those, those settings and those facilities, so you don't get overflowed. Because is, is there enough room for 60,000? In most places, it's gonna be closer to 75 to 80,000 to get in the mezzanine level, and is that really the safest place to, place to be? Absolutely not. So that, that's the danger. We haven't seen a lot of issues with that, but I hate to say that the time could come where you get a big hit on a stadium uh, and an issue, and there's a lot of people that are going to be directly affected. So uh, that, that is a real concern, and that's something that why this position statement was started to be addressed uh, to keep people safe. Again, we're not talking about just keeping athletes safe. Everybody associated with these events is a big focus of this paper. May I shift to concussions? Uh, I have... Uh, grandchildren who play football, they're not that old, uh, started playing uh, tackle football at the age of eight. And that's around here, it's very common. And I realize that those children who are hitting one another are very small, but they hit with impact. Uh, how, how dangerous is it for children of that age to be playing tackle and, and full contact sport like football? Depends how you define dangerous. Um, everyone has their own relative definition of it. Are those, um, you know, if your definition of dangerous is whether or not every one of those kids will suffer a concussion because of what they're doing, then, then, then I'll say no, it's not dangerous. If your definition of dangerous is there are a lot of things that we still don't know about concussion, certainly the long-term implications of repeated head trauma and not just injuries, but, you know, typical college football player sustains a thousand head impacts each season. He may have one, he may have two, he may have no concussions that are diagnosed, but he still has sustained a thousand hits to the head. You know, if you hit your arm a thousand times, you might not fracture it, but it's gonna hurt, right? It's gonna be really painful. And if you do that over and over and over again, at some point, something's gotta give. And so if your definition of dangerous is, we still don't know what all these repetitive sub-injurious or sub-concussive head impacts will do to an athlete 30, 40, 50 years down the road, then, then, then that could potentially be dangerous. Um, unfortunately, I don't have an answer for you. Uh, and in order to get that answer, it'll, it'll take a 40-year study to do that. Um, some of the, the publications that have been put out there, and certainly if you're in sports media, you've heard of a condition called chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Um, it's a condition that right now is only diagnosed post-mortem, uh, so it certainly doesn't help us in living people to identify that condition. But there is no direct link to head trauma. There's a strong association, but it, that's not cause and effect. Um, and there are a lot of other things that professional football players do in their careers leading up to the NFL and certainly the extracurricular things they do while they're playing. Um, drug abuse, alcohol abuse, uh, you know, s substance abuse, steroid, you know, th things that players did during their careers and after their careers to cope with not playing in the professional league, the depression and so on and so forth. And we don't know what those things may have caused or led to chronic traumatic encephalopathy to, to kind of go back four years and say it's because of those six concussions you reported is very weak evidence to s suggest cause and effect. Now, it could be the case. We don't know that yet, though. 
Um, so the eight-year-old playing contact doesn't scare me as much as the eight-year-old playing contact who's being taught by someone who has a really old-school mentality that lets his eight-year-olds do Oklahoma drills in the middle of a, a fall camp. That scares the living crap out of me. Uh, but the coach who chooses or, or, or who coaches and teaches athletes safe ways to to, to thud properly, it's not open full contact practices all the time, you're taking the time to teach the fundamentals of the sport so that they can develop the skills that they're going to need to effectively tackle safely and properly, that doesn't bother me as much. So it's really interviewing the coach. You're welcome. Doctor, to kind of follow up on that a little bit, I have a 10 year old and an 8 year old boy at home who both play football. Let's say one of them does get diagnosed with a concussion, how long would you recommend shutting them down at such a young age? to give them the proper amount of time to recover from that? Yeah, it's an excellent question. I, there's a part of me that wishes concussion were as straightforward as an ACL reconstruction mm -hmm. where I could tell you almost to the day, six months later, will they'll be back on the field fully participating in their competition. Fortunately, concussion isn't. I've seen athletes that are extremely symptomatic at the time of injury that take four or five days to recover. I've seen athletes that complain of a very mild headache that six months later are still complaining of that headache. Um, so there's nothing at the time of the injury that we can say, okay, you're going to be in this bucket where you'll need 12 days off and you're in this bucket where you'll need 13 days off and, and so on and so forth. So to give you a kind of black and white statement, um, what, what I can encourage you to do is to make sure that, that your son is symptom free at rest, that they're symptom free with exertion and that the decision to say, okay, go back, is a gradual one. So they start with a very light activity, they progress to sports-specific activities, to non-contact practice, to a contact practice, and ultimately back to the game. And each of those steps should be about 24 hours because you wanna see, once they participate in the activity, how do they feel the next day? Did that result in symptoms kind of coming back or getting worse? And so you wanna make sure they're symptom-free at rest, they're symptom-free with some level of exertion, and then you wanna progress them back and it's not a kind of on-off switch where they go back to full contact right away. And I'd like to add to that, uh, on top of that, we talk about the activities because we talk about athletes, but it's really important to look at the cognitive function of what these students are doing, especially a young brain that's reading text messages, watching TV, doing homework, taking tests. And they're finding the fact that the more this brain is working, it doesn't have to be the physical exertion, the more you're gonna delay those symptoms. So it's important when you're curtailing what they're gonna do for activities, which is a no-brainer, it's important that you're backing off in the homework and really decreasing how much stimulus those, those young brains are getting. Taking the cell phones away, dark, quiet room. The quicker you do that early on, you get a jump start on that recovery. Because too often I see it, athletes young and old that may not be in practice, they're out, so to speak, but they're still doing a lot of work with their brain. And when you, you talk about the cellular issues that are taking place with the healing brain, it's important you're removing that kind of stimulus as well, especially a young athlete. And when you do that, you're gonna see a lot of that recovery happen first to the point then you can start looking at that um, physical exertion like uh, Jason said. We told our boys that if they suffered a concussion playing football that we were gonna shut them down for the rest of the year of that football season. Is that overly cautious? Is that going a little too far? I mean, again, dealing with it on a case-by-case -case basis, is it safer to just, with an eight-year-old boy like that, to just shut them down for the rest of the year, or would you rather just deal with it symptomatically? If it's the first game of the season, um, I would say that's extremely over, overly conservative. But again, it, it, if it takes the athlete you know, eight weeks to recover from their symptoms, do you want them to go back that season? Probably not. If it takes them three days to recover from their symptoms and they seem to be doing really well and they're able to go to class and they don't have headaches and they're able to do math and their grades aren't being affected and there's a whole return to school component as well when we're talking with kids this age, if all of that is going really well and we're looking at a 10, 14 day window and it's the start of the season, then, then I think you're being extremely over, overly conservative. If it's the second to last game of the season, then shutting them down for the rest of the year kind of makes sense at that point because they'll probably need that amount of time to recover. And let me pose the question, if you play that out to the athlete ahead of time, before this season starts, Johnny, if you get a concussion, you're done for the year. You think it going to impact that subjective feedback on the athlete actually having a concussion? My answer would be yes. And I think that's a real issue. We, at the NFL, we know it's an important fact of what we're dealing with athletes, both in the NFL and, and how it trickles into other leagues, both young and old. But we know the fact we could have the greatest concussion management plan in place but if the players themselves are not reporting those concussions in a proper, timely manner, that's a real issue. You can't implement a great system, a great policy, a great plan, both to prevent and treat injuries if they're not being reported in a timely manner. And, and personally, I think that's a big issue we, gotta, we have to do a better job with. Questions for both of you about concussions, and specifically this. How far along in the education process of coaches or professional 
college and, and, and in high school, are we, so that in the event of an apparent or obvious head injury to a player, the coach's first instinct is to protect the health of the player as opposed to getting him back in the game and, or on, in, in action as quickly as possible. How far along are we really? Well, it's, a, it's a great question, Bob, and I think an important one because that's an important step with what's there. I know in the NFL, the coaches have a mandatory concussion meeting that has to be presented to them so they have the information. The literature that's given to both the athletes and the coaches is something that's important and the players, the, the coaches have to know that. The problem is at different levels of sport. And we, we tend to want to focus on the NFL and on football itself, but you look at the numbers, you look at the soccer concussion issues, you look at a lot of these other sports that may be off the radar screen, you don't think it's an issue. I was talking to a very good friend of mine who's uh, a lawyer and, and a great athlete himself and he knows concussions real well. His, his daughter got hit in the head at a soccer game down in Orlando and everything was fine. They went to dinner and they're driving home and they hear this noise. They look over and she's laying in the, in the back seat squeezing her head with a concussion. She was out of school for three weeks. That, those symptoms actually, and she was completely asymptomatic according to her. You know, this took place about two and a half hours after the fact. So a lot of the things that are there when the coaches are involved and when the parents are involved, but I, th I think we have to do a, a much better job of that to make sure, because that's an important step. If there's pressure there to get those kids back from a coaching perspective, that's a big, big mistake. Because as we say, medical, coaching decisions cannot supersede medical decisions. And I think nothing's more important than we talk about the brain. We're not talking about a, a, an ankle sprain. We're talking about the brain that these athletes have to have for the rest of their lives. Right, and just to, just to add to that, you know, at the pro and college level, coach is there to coach and of course there's going to be pressure the coach wants to start player back out on the field and all the things that the coach needs to be worried about and I can appreciate that but there's medical people that are there in place that are trained to make these decisions and so it's it's less of an issue there because it, it falls or should anyway fall on the medical staff to say not ready you know this guy's not going back out or this gal's not going back out the issue is with the 10,000 kids in uh, you know an area of Oklahoma that are playing Pop Warner football that don't have any medical professionals there and so if we're talking about that population, and on one end we have you know, me retiring now and saying coaches are going to do a wonderful job and I don't have to worry about these kids anymore, to we're in trouble, I think we're kind of leaning more towards this side. Um, I'll pick on USA Hockey just because they've done some good things lately. Um, they have a, uh, so no parent can coach a youth hockey team unless they have some level of training. They have to pass a USA Hockey kind of coaching credential course. And there's multiple levels and obviously the more skilled the players are, the more you have to learn about the game and so you, you further your education. But even at the uh, lowest level, there's a concussion education component built into that curriculum. Um, so USA Hockey does a good job of it in the sense that if you're on the bench coaching a team, you had to have at least completed this level one training. That level one training includes some information about concussion. I'll take some over none any day. Um, the issue is when we have other sports where, okay, my son's playing football, I'm going to go coach and walk down to the local rec league and sign up as a coach. What kind of training does that individual have? And it's those things that I think we need to kind of structure around. And so whether that's USA football, it, implementing some type of program or any number of Pop Warner or any other number of uh, groups that can get together and kind of build that curriculum for coaches and at least ensure that they meet that level. But not only concussion, it's an emergency action situation. So there's issues with lightning safety. A football coach should know about lightning safety, not just about concussion. They should know what to do when someone uh, drops with uh, potential heat stroke. If you're a football coach in Georgia, it's going to happen. Um, so there should be certain things um, uh, where, where it's built into a curriculum for coaches. And if you want to coach, that's fine. That's wonderful. We love the volunteerism. It's great. But you need to learn this material or at least acknowledge that, that, that you've listened to it um, and be held accountable for it. Two quick points to add to that is one, the term we use for concussions, and I think it's something we have to ring home at all levels, is when in doubt, hold them out. Again, when in doubt, hold them out. Then you can get the medical specialist to say, is this really a concussion? Is it this or that? But at that point, if you're not really sure, it's not the decision. Like I always say, it's not necessarily to know what's wrong but know what's not right with the athlete. And if that's the case, when in doubt, hold them out and make those decisions otherwise. And I think we look at this decision, this, this puts a lot of pressure on the coaches. And I think it's what we go back to earlier, what, what John had brought up, of having an, a certified athletic trainer at these sporting events is so, so important. And in my opinion, it's the best insurance policy a school, a curriculum, a, a town, a rec league could have, is to have a certified athlete, athletic trainer who's there and is specialized in taking care of these athletes so the coaches can focus on coaching. In Vermont, we just passed, uh, literally late last week, the governor signed uh, Senate Bill S-4, which 
not only requires all the education and stuff, but it requires officials to be educated in concussion um, right. symptom recognition. But also, in two years, all Vermont schools that offer collision sports, your football, wrestling, hockey, lacrosse, and rugby, they're required to have certified athletic trainers at all home games for collision sports. And I just wrote this big three-part series about all of this, and the biggest story that came out of it was people were saying that it was going to kill those sports in Vermont because it's too expensive um, to have that kind of coverage, especially if you play soccer and football at the same time, but at different venues, how are you gonna get that coverage? How are you gonna pay for it? Um, you guys hear that nationally, and any suggestions for solutions for that? Well, a little bit. I think we have the front runner for next year's uh, award winner. <laughs> and another reason why I love Vermont, I mean, it's, th th those are smart decisions. And bottom line, when it comes to safety, they're going to come up with the thirty dollars or $40,000 it's needed to get an athletic trainer in place. And, and share, schools sharing athletic trainers and, and the way they can work it out, there's a lot of ways that that can be done. They need new uniforms, they've got to repave the track, they've got to repaint the gymnasium, they find a way to get it done. They'll find a way when it comes down to saving our lives, the lives of our young youth. Let's face it, we all had to kick in a little extra money to keep our kids healthy. I'd be the first one in line. So bottom line, I, I think they will find a way to do it. I think they're looking at issues that are there, but I, I applaud Vermont for doing something like that. Hawaii has a similar plan. I think every school, regardless of what sports they have, have to have a certified athletic trainer. And hopefully that's a, the start of many, many states doing the exact same thing. It sounds like the law doesn't require the, the school to employ the athletic trainer, just that an athletic trainer needs to be present at home events. And so there's some business opportunities there that exist as well. Uh, when I was a graduate student at University of Pittsburgh, University of Pittsburgh Medical Center uh, contracted out athletic trainers to the local high schools. And the benefit to them is if anyone is injured, they're going to get a referral to their system. Uh, mind you, UPMC essentially owns every hospital in Pittsburgh today. But, uh, <laughs> but, but, but there's the potential there for uh, local businesses, athletic training owned businesses or, or otherwise to play a role in that. And I'll turn it over to Marisa, who's kind of head of PR for NATA. Yeah, and one of the things that I wanted to note off of all of this in, in hearing how we refer to what the athletic trainers do and listening to you guys, you cover events as sports writers. And traditionally, that's what we've been saying about our athletic training staff. But you're talking about a healthcare professional that is on site to provide services. We're not there to cover the event. We are there to provide healthcare services. And that is a turn and a twist that, you know, we've been trying to hit home with lately when we are going to talk to school administrators or, you know, a, an association, a youth group. An, an athletic trainer is not there to just cover the event. They are there to provide healthcare services. They are your prevention if something happens. So they are hiring a healthcare professional to be there to prevent these injuries and if they occur to know what to do immediately. We all know that immediate treatment is, you know, what helps get these young athletes and, and our recreational sports uh, back right away. So in your writings, I implore you to try to start using, you know, when you're trying to say, my my young son's youth football group should employ the athletic trainer to provide healthcare services. You know, we're not there covering an event, we're not writing anything, we're not covering an event as an umpire, we are a healthcare provider. So that's what I just wanted to add in, in addition Great to point. that. Uh, Doc, those stats on the kickoff rule change are amazing. What, what other rule changes would you like to see at least studied, or if you think they've been studied enough, what are some rules you'd like to see change? Yeah, there's this constant uh, discussion of the trickle-down effect, right? Everyone kind of looks like the kids. The kids look to the pro athletes, right? They, they, they idolize them, and so then they see, you know, uh, Harrison hit someone with his head, and after the game say, I'm not going to change that. I'm not going to take that out of the way I play the game. And then they go to their Pop Warner practice and say, oh, I saw this great hit yesterday. I'm going to try and do this. Um, we need to get rid of that. So there, there are rules in place to eliminate those head impacts, and we need to make it extremely expensive for athletes to think it's a good idea to do it. Uh, we need to, to make it a point to, to say we're going to get that out of the game. The, the whole intention of the tackle is to stop forward progress of the ball. It's not to disassociate head from body, right? That was never in the rule. It, it, it was never part of the game. 
but we've allowed it to evolve to that point. I'll let Mike talk more about the pro side of it. You know, another uh, sport, um, you know, hockey, for example, there's a lot of discussion about fighting in the NFL or NFL in the NHL um, and whether, you know, they should ban it and so on and so forth. And, you know, you look at some of the hits that have occurred in the playoffs and some of them were head hits and some players have been suspended, and rightfully so, because they have a rule that, that, that prevents those types of hits. But fighting's allowed. And if you're going to suspend someone for intentionally body checking and striking them in the head, why wouldn't you suspend them for fighting? You're intentionally striking an opponent in the head, right? But you get a five minute penalty and you're back in the game. That doesn't make sense. And to a kid or to a parent watching the game, that's, that's a lot of mixed feelings, a lot of mixed emotion. It just doesn't make sense. So one of the things is if you're going to ban hits to the head in hockey, then you have to ban fighting. Whether you agree with that or not, it's, it's the logical argument. And so you can't say, well, fighting's okay, because then no one will hit someone with their shoulder to the head. They'll just punch them instead, right? And which is worse. Mm -hmm. And so that logic, it just doesn't make sense, right? So you either ban it, or you don't, you live with the consequences, but having kind of, it's okay this time, but it's, but it's not okay this time, just doesn't make sense. I, I, I agree, and I think some of the things we've done in the off season, as far as practices uh, and workouts they can do and set time limits and not with the helmet during certain times, so basically kind of like North Carolina has done a great job of looking at those numbers, and they came up with great numbers and really opened the eyes of a lot of people, and you saw that these athletes have been up to a thousand sub-concussive hits over the year year after year after year and how those things add up. So looking at, at the level we're doing and, and minimizing that kind of trauma over a longer period of time, uh, we hope we'll have a, a positive income uh, outcome at the end. Right, well, we've had, if I can just add to that, so we've had coaches um, that uh, enjoy the contact part of practice. They enjoy the full contact. And we've had coaches that have had pro experience where that's not really what they do day in and day out. It's kind of more thud practices and things like that. And, and it's, it's very different to see the evolution from one coach to the next, even within our own setting at, at, at UNC. One of our very first publications looked at impacts that were sustained in helmets only practices, compared them to full contact practices and comparing that to game collisions. And on average, the head-to-head the -head collisions in helmets only practices were on average more severe than the ones we were seeing in the game. And so there is no light day unless you would completely eliminate contact from practice. And so the Ivy League took some of those data and made some of their rule changes up there to prevent the number or to limit the number of contact practices a team in their league is able to, to, to um, experience or undergo. But that's one league, right? How do you change the ACC? How do you change the SEC? How do you make it so everyone's on the same page? Um, you know, that's always going to be an issue. Mike, uh, one more lightning question. Uh convince me that it really is dangerous and you should get off the course when you're golfing if there's lightning. You should, but really the safest thing to do on a golf course during a lightning storm is to hold up a two iron. You because not even God can hit a two iron. <laughs> <laughs> but but you, 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 should, you should leave. Because what do people do? They go underneath the trees and, and that's a problem. I, I live about a mile from Sawgrass in Ponte Vedra, uh, the uh, PGA headquarters. And, you know, you can hear the sirens from there when they have, they have issues and they blow the sirens, everybody has to get out and get into the clubhouse. But yeah, it's not, not a great place to be being out there. And I know you don't want to leave the golf course. It's, it's hard to get on, but, but bottom line, it is dangerous. And you're in a golf cart with metal lightning rods in your hand, so yeah. Play through. Play through. <laughs> and stand next to the tall guy with the metal plate. <laughs> hey, Mike. Oh, yeah, that's. Mike, I was wondering how you and the fellow NFL trainers feel about all these new NFL rule changes, especially one with the running backs, you know, being penalized for leading with their helmet. I wonder how the Jacksonville Jaguar players feel about it. Well, it's going to be interesting, and it's a different mindset. Uh, I think initially there's that shock about what are you going to do. Um, I haven't had a direct conversation about, with Maurice Jones-Drew about it. You know, he's one of those low plow guys. So, uh, it, it might change the way he's doing things. but. But bottom line is that I think the, the players, when they make these changes, a lot of times the players are a little shocked, but what are we going to do? But once you get into the routine, you work, you practice that way, you get used to it, and everybody's doing it, it's equal on both sides, it's kind of a neutralized with what's there. But I think ultimately the players know they're being taken care of. They know there's a safety factor there, and they know long term they're going to be much happier with that. Uh, there's a big issue, like we talked earlier about subjective feedback in a timely manner with the concussion issues. They don't want to say something because it, the, the landscape is such that when guys too get a concussion, they could easily be out for two weeks with, with a minor concussion, depending how the symptoms come around. So the players don't want concussions. The players don't want to get hurt. The players want to protect their body. So rule changes that they know they're equal across the board and they're protecting themselves, they like it. They know it's there. And, 
it, it's something that they know is going to help them both short term and long term. But there is a learning curve. And that's why when those changes go in early on and they can practice, and that, that's been a mindset of our coaches already, the guys to get used to what you need to do. Because if you don't practice that way, I, I have the conversation, interesting conversations with the players all the time. But one of them was, there was a story that came out, it had to have been 15 years ago, about a guy who was a, a big skydiver. And he, was, he had all his friends, he talked him into skydiving. So he's up there with him, he has a camera on his helmet, but he's not jumping. And he's helping all the guys out, and he's high-fiving all his buddies are jumping out. Well, the last guy goes out, an old boy jumps out with no parachute. And players are like, that is the stupidest thing. You, you, how could he do that? How could he do that? And I said, it is very stupid, but I skydive seven or eight times, and I can tell you the fact that you get in that mindset. It's such a rush. And I said, I guarantee you, as a football player, I said, how long have you been playing football? 15 years, whatever it may be. And you've got a metal cage sitting here, inch off your nose. I guarantee you, you go out there and play in a street pickup fo football game, and that guy comes at you, you're going to drop your head. This guy had a reminder was out of sight on his back. Still stupid, still dead. But bottom line, if you had something an inch from your nose, I guarantee your mindset's going to go back to hitting with that hit. So same thing here. They have to practice, and they have to get used to practicing that way. And it's going to be a big focus. So I think once the games get rolling around in September, yeah, there are going to be some calls in, um, in the preseason that you guys are going to have a lot of stuff to write about as they kind of work things out. But I think bottom line is the athletes are safer, and I think they respect that. We have any other questions? And he meant to say athletic trainer, Ellen. So. I know. <laughs> Is that all? Nobody else. All right, well, we'd like to thank you for attending today's brunch in our sports medicine uh, seminar. And again, thank you, Mike and Jason, um, for the timely and great topics. And Mike, that was a great segue for your joke. So, so thank, thank you. you. Appreciate the hanging that curveball. That was thank great. <laughs> so thank you thank very you. much. <laughs>